Please take your seats quickly, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Tennis Weekly with Joel and Kim, sponsored by DownloadTennis.com. On today's Tour Catch-Up. Team World win the Labour Cup. Roger Federer plays his last match. And Brandon Nakashima notches his first tour title. Kim, Chris, today is the 26th of September and we are here to catch up on the last couple of weeks in tennis at Tennis Weekly HQ. We had a mad dash to the finish for our US Open coverage and we had to take a little bit of a breather and it feels like the whole of the tennis landscape has been turned upside down. Roger Federer has now played his last match. Team World, who would have thought Team World have won the Labour Cup and Kim, your favourite, Brandon Nakashima, has won his first ever singles title on the ATP Tour. As always, there is lots and lots of things to talk about. I knew it was only a matter of time before Brandon <laughs> got over that finish line. Yeah, so much to talk about, especially from the last you know, couple of days. What with it all going on in London, the Labour Cup. I think that's where we're inevitably going to have to begin. Uh, major scenes on court on Friday, especially. But, I mean, we haven't recorded in a while, so... You know, are you both are you both keeping well, both surviving without having done a, a pod last week? Well, I mean, I think we I've also... I've got the shakes. I've have had you? the shakes. Because yeah. of the uh, the announcements in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> it just didn't feel right. Like last Monday, I think, Kim, Kim, you were watching TV and I had to make a joke with you about how I have afforded you this day off from podcasting well... duties. To be fair, it was Her Majesty the Queen's funeral, so we thought, out of respect as well, we would we would take a a breather for that day and, and pay our respects. So um, it has but, all happened, know, hasn't it? It has a lot has happened in the last few weeks, absolutely, um, including a, a new monarch and a new a prime minister as well uh, here in the UK. So and Ellie Goulding on a tennis court. Exactly, at the Lava Cup, which yes, I think she tweeted. Yes, indeed. She thought she was at the Lava Cup, but nevertheless, Roger Federer and Rafael Nadal were very emotional listening to her sing um, the, the title song from the Bridget Jones soundtrack for the third I'm impressed film. with your Bridget Jones knowledge there. Still yeah. falling for you, the title. I know we've already <laughs> spoken pre-recording for about 20 minutes on the on the songs that Ellie Goulding mm. chose, and I know that's going to be a big topic uh in the the episode to come but also kim you spotted as well roger federer's instagram we obviously got the the selfie with uh the players minus uh rafael nadal and roger federer incorrectly tagged that he was at uh london bridge where he, in fact he was at tower bridge yeah and you know what that's not the first time a tennis player's done that i think mm, rafa did that a few rookie. years ago at the uh you know for the O2 he might be the greatest of all time but his <laughs> his knowledge of bridges needs to be upped in London doesn't it he did maybe it for the lights <laughs> yeah or maybe they just don't have as many exciting bridges in in Basel I, I don't know please <laughs> listeners let us know but um, he's in London yeah. <laughs> there was a bridge forgive him for that <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah we do have an awful lot to talk about I mean let's let's begin with Federer because we'll get onto the dynamics of the Labour Cup later but we saw him in action with Rafa you know his his greatest rival and, and obviously friend um, they were playing doubles together against Sock and TFO um, the, very late on Friday night it didn't start to I think just gone 10 so by the time it had all finished you know I, I mean I didn't go to bed till about 1am and I was a bit shattered the next day but you know I can't imagine all the people in the, in, in the audience obviously they were gonna have to, to stay you can't walk out halfway through Federer's last tennis match but I know some people might have struggled to have got home after that or to the hotels. But um, yeah, Roger Federer, end of an era, end of a career. Um, it could have been a win on his last match. They did have a match point, but uh, in, in, you know, in that Champions tie break. But I have to say, Jack Sock, you know, showing his doubles prowess and uh, getting him and TFO for Team World over the line there, which obviously did prove quite a crucial victory in, in hindsight. Um, but it was just such a nice, just such a nice moment to see Roger and Rafa play doubles you know happens once in a blue moon it's uh not often you see that and knowing it's definitely going to be the last time unless I guess they play in you know masters or what have you or exhibitions um yeah what did you make of that match for for a start and then what did you make of the scenes that followed I mean not talking about Ellie Golding and her music which was obviously an interesting addition but you know the actual 
tennis. What, what did you make of that? I was quite surprised when um, the announcement came because I did think if he was going to retire, it might be his final sort of match in Basel potentially. And I still think maybe he might do like an exhibition, but he seemed to be playing really well. I mean, I saw some of the service stats from that match and I still think he could teach um, Francis TFO and Jack Sock a thing or two about serving based on how many of his serves were unreturned. I think um, it was, I mean, he's obviously playing well, but it's a, uh, it's clear from what he said in his press release that his body doesn't necessarily um, isn't able to hold up like it used to, but the level of tennis was, was great. And it was a high entertaining doubles match. I just, um, think that Jack Sock and TFO didn't get the memo that the result that they're looking for for that one point was a Federer win. <laughs> yeah, it was, you know, it was, I think it was impressive the level that Federer showed. It's amazing mm. that he's able to, you know, I was surprised actually the, the level he brought out given how little he has played this year, given also this wasn't, you know, this wasn't meant to be the script. It wasn't meant to be that he was going to retire at the Labour Cup. You know, he was announced to play in Basel, and, you know, who knows, it might have been a little bit more prolonged. But unfortunately, it got to a moment for him where he just felt that his body was ready to retire. And it was, you know, a big, a big shame. And I, you know, when I, I read the statement and I, I heard the news you know, breaking and, got, you know, got the notification on my phone, I... I felt like, to me, it felt more definitive than, you know, what we've heard, for example, from Serena Williams, where, you know, it was, you know, I'm evolving away from tennis, but never say never. And we've still got these sort of rumours and hearsays like, oh, could she come back given, you know, what she'd showed us at, you know, the US Open. But I think for me, for this, when this statement came out, it felt it felt a lot more definitive to me. Yeah, we know he's not going to come back as as someone like even a Nash Barty might or even yeah even a Serena Williams who's talked about evolution I think with Federer this is it his body is just physically not he did make that distinction Kim of competitive (laughs) career and I think he's gonna do maybe we'll see some exhibitions from him I think he wants to um, still stay close to the game it seems like in a way that potentially I don't think Serena's gonna be you know doing commentary too much or anything between uh no. yeah now and when we may or may not see her again but well i mean there's already talk of maybe him becoming a labor cup captain mm-hmm. um with borgen McEnroe, i think uh being signed on for the next uh event uh, in canada but beyond that i think they are that's their that's going to be their final one so there could be an opportunity there but yeah i think <laughs> I think that's what I think that's what's so amazing, isn't it, about Roger Federer is that we just he's so intrinsic to tennis and the idea of him not being in tennis. It's just it's still just really hard to to fathom and and think about in your heads. And and maybe, you know, for a lot of us, we don't want to think about that. And it's almost great to hear that he's, I think, you know, accepted. Yes, competitive tennis. My competitive career is at an end. But at the same time, I hope he thinks, and I think we all think that he's still got a lot to give to the tennis world. Oh, for sure. I think the strange thing about this is you couldn't really have two more different sorts of retirements for Serena and for Federer. Mm. With Serena, I think it was, and I'm a big, big Serena fan, but it did go on and the hype was monumental around it. Like we did say, I think- It was really drawn out, wasn't it? Oh, Versus this where it's been very- quick it's almost like an irish goodbye isn't it or like a yeah. french goodbye whatever yeah. so just, just i know them well the statement no. what's an <laughs> irish goodbye i mean you just I'm leave and you don't tell anybody <laughs> oh really is that yeah. an irish thing okay. i think it's oh. put a name of a country and say goodbye at the end of it i think it, it, it works <laughs> oh, okay. however that works but yeah when I mean, it was a, an audio file it wasn't necessarily like a sit down interview thing it wasn't in vogue magazine um, and then suddenly it was his last match was a week later. So I don't think it's really hit many of us in terms of the fact that, you know, we won't see him playing at Wimbledon again. And this the Labour Cup, although obviously it's a big event, it doesn't quite have the same um, hold as it does for a tournament like Wimbledon or um, a home tournament for him. So it does feel a little bit for me uh, kind of in, not not the, not the, the fairy tale goodbye. And I think... That was probably true in terms of the fact that they didn't get that win on Friday night. Bit selfish, really, of uh, Sock and TFO to ruin the party, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> doesn't doesn't Federer pick who plays? <laughs> Isn't he, yeah, doesn't he I run know. the event? <laughs> Couldn't they have staged that last couple of points? <laughs> I mean, it is wild. You talk about uh, you know Wimbledon and that and that that match against Hubert Hercage 
Oh god! That, that final set, which has turned out to be the final set of his, uh, you know, his singles career. Uh, he got, you know, he got bageled. Mm. Um, and you know, you think, I think, yeah, you know, again, those comparisons with Serena Williams. I think, you know, she had that moment where she had to retire. And, you know, she had a really nasty fall on on centre court, and she didn't want to leave it like that. And it felt like, you know, Federer was almost in a similar, I guess, situation, but again his body was not able to kind of give him that moment where he could you know go back to Wimbledon but I think regardless of of what his his body has been telling him is was still I think a, a fantastic send-off in a tournament also that you know he he has you know he has created and built with you know Rod Laver and his and his team and given the kind of the unexpected and the, the kind of short-term shock of it all it still was an amazing kind of event to, to put together and you could see that not just in the fans I think but also in all the other players there as well it was very highly charged highly emotional I mean Kim Rafael Nadal sitting on the bench with Roger Federer I feel like that's just going to be etched into everyone's memories going forwards because they've obviously been such big rivals but, but such big friends at the same time. And I think that's, you know, what we've seen, what's been amazing as, as tennis fans is we've seen that really blossom, you know, over over their rivalry. Yeah, and I think that's a lot of my, like, non-tennis friends, um, you know, they knew that Federer was was retiring and they saw those photos and they thought, why? They were like, why is Rafa retiring? And I think they, um, they just didn't realise, I think, the extent to which they were you know, not just rivals, but but friends and how close that bond was. They've shared so many special moments on on the tennis court and over such a long period of time, you know, the past like 20 years almost. And seeing Rafa like in absolute, you know, floods of tears is um, what kind of made me go, uh, if you like. Uh, and then there's that picture of them like basically holding hands on the bench. And it's, it makes you realise, you know, <laughs> what they've shared and this era that we've had is is a you know it's it's over by you know Federer is the first one to go and I think with Rafa he knows that his time is quite soon as well like he's struggling quite a bit at the moment with with injury and he's having some I think personal issues back home which is why he you know he went back to Mallorca and I think really only came over to to do that match you know because of Federer I don't think he would have been at the Labour Cup otherwise um and I think you know he obviously really felt it and I think that's <laughs> that's what got got me and obviously you know everyone was was super emotional but yeah and just all the scenes with Roger and his family it's um I think London were lucky that they got to witness it and the Labour Cup you know was the kind of chosen venue I think that really actually added that extra level of intrigue to the event which I think has been at times like guilty of you know not being the most exciting um I think like the last time it was played you know we didn't have all the big four there it was very one-sided we got a completely different um cup this time around because it was more competitive and we had this extra story with the retirement which I think brought in a lot of people and you know we saw the cost of the tickets and what have you that was certainly being reflected in uh, the pricing wasn't it I mean, the prices couldn't get much higher than they were to start with. So I think um, it really was a spectacle. And, I, and as you say, like I think the Labour Cup needed um, needed like a, the big four participation. It needed a close result. And obviously, um, that's what they got because it has been, as you say, a bit of a, a non-event when it comes to the competition. And especially with it being so close this time, I mean, the players were up off their bench all the time. Every point was an, like a big point because of the nature of what the situation was in terms of the scoring being so close. So I think it made for a pretty mega event. I think it's, um, I was quite surprised it was on the Friday that that's kind of the biggest match of the, the tournament, but I guess maybe it's, it would be too much pressure, you know, if, if the final doubles, they played it on the, on the Sunday, but were you surprised by the, it being the first doubles of the tournament? Uh, I'm, yeah, not not so much. You know, I think you know Friday evening. I, you know, I think what was great for me was the fact that it was a, a doubles match. I think, you know, we'll get on to in, in the second half how you know mixed a mixed event is coming back to replace the, the ATP Cup. And I think, you know, seeing rivalries or you know people who've you know been across the court so many times, seeing them play doubles together, it's a real special moment. And I think that added to the you know the occasion and again it just elevated doubles to a space that I think for years you know certainly for me kind of growing up doubles has been on the the periphery so to to see it as a format also get center stage and just show how much drama there can be because we had so many great uh you know close 
uh, matches in in the Labour Cup, you know, this year, particularly in the, in the doubles. And I thought it was just, you know, very very entertaining. It was obviously very sad. I think that, you know Federer and Nadal lost, but I think I think you know a lot of people will say, including myself, that like the result you know doesn't matter in 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 that context and i think i think for me that was the kind of question once i got over kind of the emotion of of federer retiring and this happening at the labor cup was because team world won and that was a shock in itself if you look at it on paper in in terms of statistics and the history as well the fact they'd never won it before um did you feel like the roger federer retirement overshadowed the kind of event that in the sense it took a little bit of the shine off the the team world win i actually think the timing of having federer on the friday meant that that was sort of got out the way earlier than yeah he was still there coaching and encouraging and i thought he was great actually at doing that and that's what i love about the labor cup is you get to see mm. that interaction and i think that definitely there's a role for federer doing that <laughs> going forwards but i think actually by the sunday it was like oh um it's yep. actually pretty close who's going to get this is it going to go down to that final match and i think i'd sort of not forgotten about Federer retiring, obviously it's such a big thing, but I think actually maybe that's what they thought. They mm. wanted to make sure that the retirement was its own enclosed thing in a way. And so that's why they did it on the first day. That, that does make sense. And also Federer has always wanted to give kind of younger players a spotlight as well when it comes to this mm. sort of thing and the people he invites. Like I know he invited Carlos to this event this year. And I think kind of having the the younger players playing in those moments, I think he knows that, I guess, the singles and the nature of the game is obviously moving away from him. He's he's leaving the game. So I guess that is kind of nice that it rested on some of the, the other Team Europe and... Um, players they were bringing out all the alts weren't they for uh for team team europe with uh, yeah. what, berrettini cam mm. nori as well last leg some of them it seemed <laughs> well exactly myra is being bandaged up i mean i know we speak about kind of the, the big four you know roger federer i mean looking at some of his achievements i need mean, this is such a hard question but i'm just going to rattle off some of the statistics for me that are like the most you know Un, to me are unbreakable you know at the moment 237 consecutive weeks at world number one 24 consecutive tour level finals 23 consecutive grand slam semi-finals 65 straight wins on grass 1526 matches zero retirements and you know for me what's the most amazing oldest world number one um, at 36 years old in, in 2018. I mean, what to both of you, what kind of sticks out in terms of records that, that Roger Federer has achieved? Because I think, you know, for me, there are going to be records here that will be broken. You know, Novak Djokovic is, you know, still playing. Rafa Nadal is still playing. So whilst they're there, I feel like some of his records are still quite kind of maybe, maybe vulnerable. But what to you kind of stands out in terms of what he has achieved across his his whole career? For me, I think, I mean, the fact that he was the first person to get to 20 slams, you know, I think that's, mm. I know Rafa's now surpassed him, but I think that was a massive thing at the time. And, you know, he he surpassed like Sampras and or, that was obviously such a big deal at the time. Some of his epic Grand Slam finals, you know, whether that's with Rafa or like that Wimbledon one against Andy Roddick, um, that, that Novak one, which, you know, he had the match points and lost at, at Wimbledon. I think just those particular matches rather than maybe number of weeks at, at world number one or, or what what have you I think those early years as well before Rafa came on the scene when he literally was just you know dominating to the nth degree um but I think a lot of people will maybe say just the what the style the way he plays rather than numbers because that's something that you can't compare to anyone else it's so funny you talk about that era of him when he just kind of dominated in that sort mm. of Leighton Hewitt, post Leighton Hewitt, world number one era. And I remember kind of going through that, just thinking, oh God, tennis is so boring. And like Roger Federer just, you know, wins it all. But it's, you when you kind of put it into context after all these years and actually just look back on it, you just, I think you just have this greater sense of appreciation of, man, you know, what a time that was when Roger Federer was at the kind of complete peak of his powers and just watching him on another level um, on a tennis court was, yeah, it was just a thing of beauty to to behold across, you know, across a whole season. His dominance really was majestic at that time. I don't necessarily think it was, um, I think it was, I mean, personally, I found it very engaging. I think it was mm. almost, you know, unthinkable that he would lose at Wimbledon. And I mean, it, from 2003, 2009, he made 21 of his 28 major singles finals. I mean, it was kind of 
completely kind of uh, crazy. And then it was a shock if he didn't win. Yeah, and I think and to play like that and play with the pressure of that and to take the game where he did, I think it um it was it was unbelievable. I think kind of there are some uh, memories about it. I'm very pleased that he managed to get um you know the French Open title thanks to <laughs> Robin Soderling. Um, but I think... Oh, God, yeah, yeah. That was... Um, I mean, he might never have... I mean, I don't want to take... Sorry, Fed fans, but that was a, an interesting year, wasn't it? And he was... down. To, wasn't he down two sets to love against Tommy Haas in that tournament? Just after Nadal had been knocked Ooh, out? Good, it was, good knowledge. Good knowledge. Yeah, there. and I remember watching him sitting there and he looked so chilled out. And I thought, Roger, this is your time. Like, you need to... And then he came back and won it in five. But... um. Yeah, I mean, as we've talked about, I mean, the numbers you can't really, you can't really appreciate some of these numbers. And although some of the records, as you say, have been surpassed, I think I'm with Kim being the first one to break that and being obviously significantly older than kind of some of his great rivals. I think it's um, that made the achievement even more impressive because it really felt like he kind of triumphed to get the odds to to win kind of the Australian Open in 2017 and 2018. And so, I mean, let's let's look at the rest of the Labour Cup because I think we saw some interesting kind of performances as well. We had Felix auger beating Novak Djokovic. Djokovic seemed to be struggling with a wrist injury. Um, yeah, he hasn't pulled out so far of Tel Aviv where he was due to play singles and doubles. So I'm, maybe he's sort of deciding um, as we speak, but he did seem to be wincing and and struggling. So great win for Felix. He, he also won his doubles on the Sunday, which is two vital wins for team world why can't he do that at grand slams i feel like he does so well <laughs> in in these tournaments where i'm not actually expecting a lot from him but yeah for me he was he was arguably i think mvp for uh for team team world he did lose to baratini in singles though i believe right? yeah true yeah, on the saturday yeah. he lost but um and novak obviously did double duty on saturday night and and won so i was kind of thinking oh no that's mm. just gonna run away with this now for for team europe i think everyone got a fair fair shout you know we saw cam nori getting involved and he narrowly lost um i there think was it a was lot a of narrow good, narrow narrow matches. results yeah, yeah. But so diego schwartzman he amount. he had to get kind of least valuable player with a one and two loss to stefanos yes. that. that was <laughs> everything was so true. close and that just really mm. stuck out like a sore thumb from a <laughs> a competition perspective it didn't really get mm. going I think this was the first Labour Cup that I've really, um, and maybe this is a bit of bias because it's in London and so the mm. times, you know, time zones worked better. Um, and I knew people you know, who were physically there. I wasn't able to go myself, but I think it was the one I was most invested in and, and not just because of the Federer thing, but yeah, I feel like Team World had a, I think a better team. And then obviously apart from Diego Schwartz when they, and, and <laughs> Alex de Menor, they're pretty much all North America, aren't they? Um, so I kept referring to them as America, which I know is not um, correct <laughs> at all. But I think that helped them as well, because a lot of them like play together all the time anyway. So they obviously had a really good bond. But my my main thing of the Labour Cup is Borg and McEnroe don't really seem to do an awful lot. Like at the side, um, I don't really see them giving advice. It's, it's like always the rest of the team. Um that are like coaching and guiding mm. whoever is, is playing. And I'm, I'm kind of like, oh. Kim, they're, they're too busy going, role? swanning down to, <laughs> they're too busy swanning down to Wimbledon to recreate a, a photo of their famous, <laughs> their famous match back in what, 19, 1980. I don't know if you saw that on, on social media. I did see that. If they hadn't have taken that, yeah. Joel, no one would have known this was happening. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> that was vital PR. You guys yeah. work in PR. You know how it works. Yeah, we should have. We really should have. Um, actually, we did advise them that that was what they needed, not the retirement. Yeah. <laughs> uh... Yeah, it was it was interesting. I think everyone obviously loves seeing the engagement between you know between players, and it, I find I do find it fascinating the dynamics. Like I was particularly fascinated by kind of the Murray Sissipas dynamic. I mean, I understand now they they follow each other on Instagram, so they must Big have moves. you know yeah exactly well exactly. But um, you know, I think for me, what was I guess quite sad just following on from that kind of Federer you know Federer announcing the Federer retirement is. You know, this was very much marketed, I think, heavily on the big four back together, you know, playing for team, you know, playing for, for team Europe. And you say on paper, you look at how many Grand Slams they've won between them and compare that to, you know, compare that to team world. It felt very, very formidable. And, you know, you talk about kind of the retirement of, of Federer, like to me, the fact that, you know, team world came and won against the big four and, you know, I think Casper Ruud was actually the best player for for team uh, 
for Team Euro. I think he went undefeated. But one of one. Well, he is the world number two now. So what, yeah. What, what else would you expect? I was surprised he didn't maybe get fielded against Tiafo yeah. instead of Sitspas in that um, second to last match. But I guess yeah. they were saving him for the, the potential decider. Yeah. But it felt to me like this was like the big four now is is also sort of in retirement oh, like yeah. or is gone because mm. it's not as formidable as it once was. And it was shown that in, in this year's Labour Cup. I think the Labour Cup for me, I'm... A- I'm going to say something a bit controversial, but I think it sounds really good on paper and then mm. it doesn't ever quite live up to the the hype or the billings for me. Like, I think I was most excited about this Labour Cup when all the big four said they were going to be there and when we saw them having that practice on the courts and some people kind of put some of those um, videos onto social media. Mm. And then I think when it kind then of came the Dal down... the Sky Hook smash. Yeah, I mean, I've seen that in slow-mo. Fantastic. It's unbelievable. Um, it and then great. Federer had such an easy volley and just... And, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it just it was, went it wrong. It was a bad omen, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> but uh, especially if he'd have known that was the one that was going to be highlighted, maybe he would have made that volley. Um, but no, I think it's it's the hype of it is so great. And I think having them all there was so exciting. But I think, you know, the matches didn't quite go in the way that you might have wanted. And I think it just, um, just misses sometimes that uh, perfect balance between like participation, the results being close and quality like consistently. So I feel like this one was probably the best one I've seen because it was close but I do think that with the big four it didn't quite deliver for me because of some of the unfortunate results that we saw yeah I think um this will be I guess going forwards you're not going to have I don't I I, I would be surprised if like Rafa plays it going forwards obviously Mm -hmm. they won't be Federer whether Andy probably won't I feel like it's now exciting because team world have actually gone and won it yeah it's competitive now isn't it I think next year will be so much more open and it's going to be in Canada, so Team oh, really? World are going to have home advantage. Yeah. Does it go to the winners? I think it, well, it, it just goes it to alternates, alternates anyway. Uh, yeah. okay. So you'd imagine Chapovalov will play next year if he's good enough. Um, if it's in Canada, but um, yeah, I think the only thing I would add is that some of my friends weren't weren't really sure about how the scoring worked, how the different you know each day's play has different points per match and I don't think that was particularly clear on, on some of the comms that were going out so were they getting annoyed with the term labor breaker which seemed to be <laughs> like just trending absolutely everywhere maybe that was yeah maybe that was to do with it I, I don't know but um people were I mean, confused weren't they they said please remain seated there will be a tie break now I think a labor breaker, <laughs> a labor breaker yeah yeah I mean why I, I said this earlier but I really enjoy seeing the players interact with each other and, and that sort of mm. team bench coaching I think that's great what was um, the best bit you saw this time from the the bench coaching <laughs> what were the highlights for you um I don't have one particular moment I can't think I just I think I don't know I, I, I love feel, hearing um, them talk sometimes like Federer in that first match he was like it's just so easy returning and I was like Mate, this is your first <laughs> match back in a while and he's like yeah I thought the serve would be really hard. kicking up but I'm finding it really easy to return serve we should break now and I'm like damn they, if you're that uh that successful you must really back yourself because then they did break and win that set but um some of those moments are great I just wanted to bring back bongo cam bring back bongo cam oh from, god yeah was it the Hotman Cup We'll just make things more hilarious. Um, just but yeah, no, you're right. <laughs> if I was someone like a Cam Norrie, who's obviously there for the first time, I'd be like, I can't tell Novak Djokovic what to do. I can't. <laughs> they were quiet at that back row. But you can't really be mm. like, oh, I think you should do this because I'd just be sort of like, I don't feel qualified. <laughs> and no offence to Cam Norrie, but I feel like he probably was thinking that as well. So um, talking of Cam Norrie and team events, let's quickly touch upon the Davis Cup because we had that kind of the week prior. <laughs> You've just sighed and yeah, not great. No, it's, 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 this is a great, tough one. It? I'm glad and we were on break TV. for this. <laughs> we um, were we were discussing all of last week the the doubles the doubles team oh. for GB. Did we get it wrong? Did Leon Smith get it wrong? Yes. Yeah. Of I course think... he did. You've got two of the best doubles players in the world um, on your team, well, and you didn't we were, put them why, out. We were trying to theorize why why was that not the D why was that not the go to pairing? I know they played. With each other, uh, Joe, Joe Salisbury, Neil Skupsky, Neil Skupsky in the yeah. Kazakhstan. in the Kazakhstan tie, and and they did win their match. Yes, it was in three sets. I mean, it was all very very close. You know, fine fine margins mm. in in all of the ties. It felt like, but for me, I think Leon Smith went with maybe with his heart a little bit too much and mm. went for the Andy Murray pick when maybe it wasn't necessarily the right option. 
I think the fact it was in Glasgow on yeah, home soil. Exactly. And he was like, Oh, I feel like the fans are gonna want to see Andy Murray, mm. not Bill Skopsky. But I think ultimately, yeah, that wasn't a good move. Um and also a bit of a shame, you know, in the singles like Norrie losing to like Van der Zanshorp. Um, really he should have been winning that one, um, losing to Bublik as well. Don't think that particularly helped. Um so we're not in the final finals, you know, in Malaga. We won't be there come November. We don't want to be there anyway. Say, love it. You can't win it all. Uh, <laughs> but on paper, we had a great, great team. And I think, yeah, when mm. it comes to... Sometimes that's, that's you know, a problem, isn't it? Too many good players to choose from. And it's about getting that that right lineup. So I'm sure Leon will go away and learn. Go with the form book. That's all I can say. You know, I Where's think it... Jack Draper? It, well, Jack oh, wait, Draper he's is... injured. He's injured. Isn't yeah. he playing this week? I thought I read he's oh, somewhere. Is he? Oh, okay. I think he He's might back. be in Korea potentially. I want to say. Okay. Um, so maybe he was available. <laughs> well, talking of Korea, we have had uh, a Korean tournament last week. Uh, so let's run through some of our winners on the the regular tours because we did have two WGA events: one in Seoul in Korea, and one in Tokyo in Japan. Um, both won by Russian players. So um, Alexandra and Samsonova uh, winning those events. Um, Alexandra coming out on top in Seoul. Um, uh, Emma Raducanu reached the semi-finals here, which was great. But mm. we saw another retirement again, didn't we? I mean, what, what were your thoughts on that? I think it was a left glute injury this time round, which is a bit, bit frustrating. Three love in that last set, and she had to she had to withdraw. I mean, it was it was pretty unfortunate. I mean, I was watching that. I set my alarm. I'm a, I'm an Ostapenko. Uh, well, I really enjoy the sort of tennis that she can play when it's working. Um, and if it's not working, sometimes it's also very entertaining. Like she had a, <laughs> a, a second serve well, like that went that viral. Final set, in that final set against Alexandrova. Six love. <laughs> that, that, it wasn't working that day, in fairness. But um, in, in that match, uh, the Raducanu one, I thought they were both playing really well in that first set. And Raducanu mm. was playing like yeah. a top 10 player. And then the second set, something sort of to, like, shift in her. And I just thought there's no way she's going to finish this match. And I think um, it does ask the question. We've talked about the fact Ro- uh, Rogers played, I think, was, what do you say, 1,520 something matches, mm. not one retirement. Um, yeah. Raducanu said four retirements context, in the so. last year so it does beg mm-hmm. the question about the physical training that she's having and it's lots of different injuries each time it's not always the same injury um, which is a bit more worrying because it speaks of kind of holistically a, a bigger problem rather than you know a troublesome injury she needs to rest yeah. but promising signs but not not um not great for the British number one but she's doing what she needs to do, which is to get match wins on these kind of regular tournaments. Mm. So at least that's something. Yeah. I mean, she's up. She's she's gone up the rankings, and you know, it's it's. I mean, it's amazing. That was the first time she won back to back to back matches. You know, since that that U.S. Open run, which for me is is quite crazy. But yeah, that, I mean, she had a great win, I think, against Lynette in in the quarters. I thought that was going to be a lot tighter, but. Um, yeah, it's sort of the same old story, isn't it, with kind of retirements and, you know, it always reminds me of, you know, our, our, we had a chat with, with Mike Dixon from the, the Daily Mail about, you know, Emma Raducanu and talking about, you know, her, you know, her fitness troubles and, and getting kind of a fitness plan in, 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 in place and a fitness coach in place. And I, I think we always talk about and are obsessed with who is Raducanu coached by. I, I don't even know at the moment. Is she still coached by Dmitry Tersonov? They are very that, much still together. I mean, as far as we're well. aware. Yes. <laughs> but he I'm was like, there. No... He was there. I promise you. <laughs> but there's, I don't feel like there is as much kind of talk or emphasis on the right questions. I think the right question at the moment is, you know, what what is Emma Raducanu doing you know, with her, you know, her fitness regime or, you know, how is she going to solve, uh, you know, having to you know, get getting injured in in these in these matches um and i think i think for me there's bigger issues than than coach i think it's in terms of her conditioning and how we get that right and you know do they have the right infrastructure and, and team in place to to solve that and at the moment across this season i think that the answer is no so that's the thing for me that needs to be kind of <laughs> urgently kind of sorted out i think mike dixon was the, the same on on our episode um, you know, back a, a few months ago as well. So, um, yeah, it's, it's it's just a bit frustrating. We're just kind of getting this because the tennis, the tennis is good, isn't it? She's world-class. She really is. Mm. Um, you watch her play and some of the shot making, especially in that match you just mentioned, Joel, was up to the level where she played in the US Open last year. 
I really hope it's not something bigger that, you know, that it's not like a mental thing. Because normally when we see mm. players that retire an awful lot, it, there is something kind of not quite... Um, there's other issues at, at work. So I, I really hope it's not that. I hope that it is just, you know, that she hasn't been able to get the training in that she wanted to or didn't have a great preseason, hasn't really been able to kind of get the forms, like uh, the physical conditioning since then. But it does beg the question, if you're not able to play... Um, kind of each week when she needs matches and if her body's not really ready for matches um, it might be a bit of an uphill battle a bit stop start which we've seen with you know Bianca Andreescu she had a, uh, injury problems kind of coming off that win and it can really knock your season it can take a long time to get yourself back so yeah promising week but I think it does beg the question who who is in her camp once again to be honest, it can ruin careers, can't it? And um, before we have another edition of the Emma Raducanu uh, physical... Who's in the box therapy, this week? Uh, <laughs> um, well done to Alexandra for winning that title. Good week for Tatiana Maria as well, getting to the semis. And yeah, I think I love what you've put on the script, Joel. Um, still couldn't accept defeat in final. Classic Penko for um, Ostapenko <laughs> succumbing... Yeah, I mean, she just had like classic, <laughs> classic sort of childish sort of breakdown. Can't oh, just can't accept her play. Her. <laughs> just can't accept her opponent uh, playing yeah. really, really good tennis. Um, yeah. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we also had uh, Ludmilla Samsonova uh, winning in Tokyo. She did not drop a set uh, to do that. Um, she beat a whole host of players uh, to win that title. She is on a roll. She's won 18 of her last 19 matches. Garcia esque role. Came in straight sets. Yeah, her and Garcia. Absolutely. <laughs> Do you want to know something interesting it? about this one? I read that she hired um, a sport psychologist uh, just before the start of the 18 1 that she's just gone. And she said that's been the difference for her. Mm. Bit like uh, Igor Shvontek. Like yeah, when get someone in your camp. Bench. Yeah. Yeah, sport psychologist. Emma Raducanu? Are you listening? No, I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> More people in the camp. Yeah. I mean, great week for Chinese players as well. We had Zhang Shui and uh, Chin Wen Zheng uh, doing really well at this tournament. Um, Sam Sonova is now um, up to 23 in the rankings. I'm sure she's going to go top 20 soon. Who knows? She might be top 10 before we know it. Um, but yeah, her third title of the um, season. So yeah, flying by at the moment. Uh, on the men's side, we had Lorenzo Sonigo winning in Mets. Um, he uh, beat uh, Alex Bublik in the final in, in straight sets and had beaten Herkaj in the semis. So yeah, great, great win for uh, Lorenzo Sonigo. He now completes the set of titles won on different surfaces. He's uh, achieved a, a clay, a hard and a grass court title now. Um, and I I mean, something to highlight from the week. Sam Wawrinka won his first match against a uh, top 10 player by beating Daniel Medvedev in three sets. So I'm sure that, um, well, some local fans are probably fairly Fairly yeah. keen on that result. That, that took, I mean, that took me by surprise. <laughs> that took me by surprise. I mean, uh, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting that um, as, yeah, Medvedev as the top seed. Sonigo as well, pretty, pretty handy player. Chris, I didn't watch the final, but you said to me, Bublik, as always, brought out one of his party tricks, didn't he? I have seen him do this before. And it was after the first set tie break in the second set, he had a smash. He chose not to play the smash using his strings. He played it with the handle. He <laughs> held on um, in the reverse form of how you should hold it. He made the overhead with the handle. Sonigo got back into the point, played a shot down the line, and then celebrated in wild style because that was a point that was game over for him. Um, oh wow! It's has he got a name? Has he got a name? This shot yet? Is this? Ooh. Is it? Is it like the the public the public handle? I don't, I don't know. Bublik. That's a really that's he didn't a really have a handle name. on things when he played it. That's for sure. But <laughs> I think um, what it's maybe we hope he doesn't do it again and we don't have to name it. But yeah, I, I think yeah. I've seen it before. So it's an interesting choice, and you do wonder what goes through someone's brain because that does take you've got to make a decision to do that. Like you have to fully. It doesn't feel like there's any strategic value in doing that versus like a Nick Kyrgios like underarm serve, which. I feel like it has a lot more merit and although yeah it looks like a trick on the surface actually there is like value there whereas this feels to me just like a trick he and, was throwing oh, in a lot of those underarm serves looks... yeah okay 
So I think he's just going <laughs> further into the the trick arsenal. I mean, it's impressive. He made it was a clean shot he hit with the handle, but um, mm. yeah, I mean, if you're his coach, I think you hold your head in your hands and maybe you take a, take a walk and come back. I mean, Medvedev going out just on another note, like tantrums and you know mm. having uh, issues with his behaviour on court. Um, nothing we haven't seen before, really. Um, but yeah. Losing to Stan, who's two eight four in the world, um, so I guess that and and Bublik's shot making, exciting uh, <laughs> times from Met San Diego though. This is where the action I think happened for me as a tennis fan and my one of my favourites, Brandon Nakashima, getting his first title on the tour. Excellent work. Um, he beat Marcos Giron in the uh, the final, winning in straight set, 6-4, six, 6-4. Four, six, four. So um, what's really nice is that it's his hometown as well. So what he was clearly waiting to do it here on, on home turf. And he's broken into the top 50 as a result, which does mean, and this is perhaps reflected in Team World's success at the Labour Cup, that 18% of the ATP top 50 will be American as of tomorrow. So is that the highest percentage? I know there's a lot of Spaniards flying around, but I think for the top 50, that's got to be the highest percentage of nationality. Kim, that's that's making me think, scrap Team World, Team Europe. Just, just Team, I mean, just just make just be it Team Ryder USA. Cup. Just yeah. Team USA, yeah. Just make it like Ryder Cup, yeah. Mm. But is that being, ex- you know, it's like excluding, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's excluding everyone else. Mm. Yeah, um, sorry, Schwartzman. <laughs> sorry, yeah, sorry, South America. Sorry, Diego. Sorry, Canada. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Or Australia. <laughs> yeah, it was a good week for for Nakashima. I think it was like a, a an all. I think I was reading a SoCal final. I think they were both hail from Southern California, so it was a nice one for the fans. Dan Evans as well getting to the semis, putting Davis Cup defeat doom and gloom kind of behind him. So um, yeah, good kind of week for him. But yeah, Nakashima. I mean, we've we've sung his praises before. We saw him. Well, I saw him at, at Surbiton Challenger on the, on the grass courts, and uh, yeah, he's such a great play had obviously a great Wimbledon and um yeah he's definitely going to be I think one for the f- he's definitely going to be obviously one for the future one for the now how how high do you see him going I mean this is his first title do you see him getting like what top top 20 I top, see top, top 20 10? I definitely see top 20 I think it depends how his game evolves in terms of you know being able to uh kind of back it up on a a week by week basis and he doesn't have the absolute biggest of games um so I think it will have to see how it evolves but I tell you what if you can if you can win a match on a second serve ace um that is definitely showing that you've got some style and some panache your game so um I think he'll he'll do really well I think so I I think that hopefully this is the start of of many titles but um yeah good on Nakashima his hard work has been paying off um and nice that he's done it on home turf. But um, after all that, we've had so much to catch up on from the last week or so on tour. Um, let's take a very quick break now, but we'll be back in the second half to talk about the ATP Cup getting a makeover. Um, who should possibly replace Borg and McEnroe as Labour Cup captains? And also looking ahead quickly to the seven tournaments. Yep, that's right. Seven tournaments happening on the tour next week. So do not go anywhere. Welcome back to Tennis Weekly with Joel and Kim, sponsored by DownloadTennis.com. And now we're going to move on to, uh, well, before we get into other bits and bobs, Joel um, and Chris, we have got a par for the courts, which Joel is extremely excited about. He's devised a new variation. As I've been looking forward playing. to this for so long, dreading the last, last couple the of rules? weeks. <laughs> Could you explain the rules, Joel? Please do. We I have devised a new par for the courts that is suitable for a head-to-head Kim versus Chris format. Of course, our listeners can play along as well. I don't know if it actually warrants a new name, whether it's like, I don't know, like Joel's Joel's new game. That's a bit rubbish. Joel's but... new game. Joel punishes <laughs> the other hosts. <laughs> but it's it's very, it's very, very similar to, to Path of the Courts. But basically what happens is I have got a category for you both and I'm going to ask you one by one to give an answer for that category. And if it's a correct answer, it passes on to uh, your opponent. Um, and if you get the wrong answer, then you lose the round. And I've got three 
I've got three categories and it's best of three. So first to first to two. It'll be very, 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 very obvious once I, I give you the category and we get going. But do you understand? Do you understand the gist of, of what I'm getting at? We have to give a correct so. answer. <laughs> Give until... a correct answer. Or, or it or... goes to Chris. Yeah, I, I will. Yeah. And if I feel like you're taking forever, I will ask you very politely um, to hurry up. Like Jeremy Paxman does. Exactly. Get on yes. with it. Okay. Right. <laughs> Good exactly. luck, Kim. Right. Any you... OPs listeners, that's a, a university challenge reference, <laughs> which is a show we all love here in the UK very much. Um, yes, let's get on with it. Go on, Joel. Okay. Right. Start I'm going to give Kim. Kim, you can give the first answer because, you know, you've been on the, you've been on the show longest. Um, okay. So the topic I get privileges. I have... I'm yes. like, I would love to give the first answer for the second round, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So right, the topic is U.S. Open men's singles champions since 1990. Oh, okay. It's just listing. So then. one answer. I need one answer, and then I'll tell you if it's correct, and we'll move okay. on. Okay. Right. Okay. Great. Let's go. Um, Rafael Nadal. Marin Cilic. Novak Djokovic. Uh, Stan Wawrinka. Roger Federer. <laughs> there we go. I'm going for yeah. the obvious. <laughs> uh, Andy Roddick. Daniel Medvedev. Uh, have we had Dominic Team? Uh, uh, Andre Agassi. Very good. 1999. Oh, cutting it fine. Um, can we have this year's? Carlos Alcaraz? Very good. Yes, Carlos Alcaraz. I'm is going on for there. the low hanging fruit. Very Kim. tense. Very <laughs> tense now. I'm going mainstream. Pete Sampras. Correct. Yes, first title back in 1990. Um, I'm going to go uh, Marat Safin. Very good. Oh, oh God, the tension. Joel, please Kim answer quicker. back to you. It's oh, ten. my... I want to say this person, and I'm not 100% sure. Leighton Hewitt? Oh, yes, no. 2001. Oh, okay. Is there a lad, Joel? You're just punishing defeated, us. Defeated <laughs> Pete Sampras. So, yes, that is the correct answer. Um, have we said Murray? No, we haven't. <laughs> but that was obviously a correct answer. I was there for it. Yes, 2012. Oh. I'm literally out now, Kim, so if you get this... Oh, no, Juan Martín del Potro. <laughs> yes, very good, 2009. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to get done by the clock here. Um, have we had... Oh. I think there's a couple left. Um, uh, Pat Rafter? Pat Rafter is unbelievably a correct answer, yes. 1997. That, that true? <laughs> 1998, no yes. Um, oh, he beat Greg Rosetsky, didn't he? Uh, yeah, very did good. Yes, in 97. Yes, Kim. It's all on you now. Juan Carlos Ferrero. Oh. <laughs> Wrong. He oh, was a no. finalist, Kim. <laughs> One nil to Chris. God, One Kim. nil to Chris. Did we get everyone except for... I was going to say... Who, who, um, we must have done all oh, of the years. Does this now end, Joel, because I'm out? Or can Chris carry on? No, so Chris has now won. I, okay. I, I, now I would won. not like to carry on, Kim. Yes. <laughs> I was going to say, like, Michael Chang. He was my other person. Mm, no, so, so that, you could, okay. you missed Stefan Edberg. Oh, gosh. Um, and I, I think that was pretty much it. Did, did we say, we said Stan Wawrinka, didn't we? Marin yeah. Cilic. Juan Martin we did Del surprisingly well at that one. We actually, yeah. so who, was Edberg the only one we were missing? Yeah, I think it was. Wow, I think it amazing. was. He's kind of a bit before our time. Kim, I do think I cheated. I said like the last three years. <laughs> I said the big four, three. So. Okay, fine. <laughs> um, okay, oh, right. We'll do. One. We'll we'll do we'll do another one. I know we're running out of time, but we'll do one more, one more. And Chris, okay. you get to you get to start first because Kim started Goodness. first last time. And we're gonna go with, and I think this might play into your favour this time. U.S. Open women's singles <laughs> champions since 1990 wow well, we've got to start with sloan <laughs> You're the sloan here we go sloan stevens flavia panetta oh that's a lovely one uh serena williams sam stozer uh bb bianca andrescu yep 2019 emma radicani 
Eager. Spiontech. <laughs> Naomi Osaka. Uh, Venus Williams. Uh, Lindsay Davenport. Um, Justine Annan. Um, Jennifer Capriati. <laughs> no, Kim, incorrect oh, no. answer. No, Does this wrong. mean I lose again? Yes, Chris. Oh. Chris is the winner. 2-0. Two zero. Two oh. Thank you. Zero. Thank you so much, Kim, for that one. No, I think you gave Jennifer me that as a Capriati. gift just to, so we could I, run to time. Monica Sellers, she she must be in there. Or St- Steffi Graf. I mean, yeah, you could have said Monica Sellers. I was going to go Clyster's Sabatini. Oh, Wouldn't Clyster's. have got Sabatini. Yeah. Sanchez Vicario. Oh, Hingis. 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 Kim Clysters. Oh, Maria Sharapova. Oh, Sharapova. How could I not say her? Angelique Kerber. Oh, of course. Um, so many. So, yeah, quite a, few, quite a few answers left on the table. Between now and the next podcast, Kim and I will just be Googling <laughs> champions of Grand Slam since 1990. Yes. Wins it 2-0. Well, I know. Well done, who knows? Well done. Who knows? <laughs> well done. Who knows? But, um, yeah, listeners, I hope you enjoyed. That was a new, new game. Let us know if you enjoyed that. But, uh, yeah, Kim, I feel like you've got, you've met your match here so far. So, you, you're going to need to come back fighting. I'm looking forward to the niche topics, like Caroline Garcia, <laughs> her 2022 season. Her renaissance. The renaissance will be the title, yeah. (laughs) Um, Lovely stuff. Thank you. I hope, yeah, I hope everyone at home enjoyed that one because I I like the speed element of it. It's quite like, adds that extra. It's quite stressful, Kim, no? Yeah, it is. Um, We've got a mailbag question, um, which I think is quite a fun one and very topical from Helen. So thank you very much, Helen, for getting in touch with Tennis Weekly via email. Helen has asked, who would we like to see replace Bjorn Borg and John McEnroe as the next Labour Cup captains? So I know this was touched upon a bit earlier, um, but who are you both going for on this one? I know that we we mentioned Federer for uh, Team Europe, but what are your thoughts? Chris, do you want to give us Ooh, your two pennies? I was having a, a think about this and I was thinking, you know who I'd love to see there, who's always entertaining? Gustavo Curtin would be a... Oh, a good one. Get that's Uga a good back one. In. Yeah. I was thinking that would be particularly enjoyable. He's won a, a few Grand Slams in his, ch- uh, his time and world number one. So I thought that could be good. And, you know, that keeps it very much in the, the team world, not just Team USA. And then I think I'm going to have to be particularly straightforward and basic with this. But if we ever get a chance to see Federer and if Federer is going to be coaching, I think I would love to see him you know, telling the next generation how, what they should be doing and how they could play a bit better so they can learn from the master himself. What about you, Joel? Yeah, I, I'm with you on, on Federer. I think for me, that has to happen at some point, not maybe in the immediate future, but I'd love to see that at some point. But You're not I firing would keep anybody. It <laughs> I, I would keep it in USA, though. I'm going Andy Roddick. I would love... I mean, Roger Federer and Andy Roddick had such a great rivalry, I feel, and I always feel sad about... Andy Roddick never winning one of those Wimbledon finals. And I, I've, I want to give him that opportunity to to kind of get his own back. And uh, I'd love to see that rivalry maybe just develop a little bit more in, in terms of like a... So you're giving him the Labour Cup captainship as the consolation prize to no Wimbledon. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think he's like a great personality. I think he's hilarious on Twitter. I loved when Federer announced his retirement. Roddick was like, oh, I'm coming back, guys. Wimbledon <laughs> is mine. Um, but um, yeah, I'd quite like to see Roddick uh, get involved. Or, or maybe Del, Del Potter, I think, also be a good oh, Del a Potter. good personality to have. He's had a rough but, um, ride. Give him the captaincy. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking, I want, yeah. If, if, if America is going to be you know, the bedrock of, of Team World, which feels like it might be, uh, you know, in future editions, then maybe it makes sense to keep it um, with an American. And I think yeah, they should think also Andy make Roddick. them do a dance audition, having seen <laughs> some of the dancing <laughs> from John McEnroe and actually the I teams themselves. I thought you were going to say, he needs to stick to his guitar. Goulding rocks he up needs again. to stick oh, to yeah. his guitar. Yeah, I think, yeah, maybe um, we should say, I think Gustavo Curtin might be a bit of a better dancer, but maybe Andy Roddick can <laughs> throw it down. Who knows? I think they're good shouts. I think um, for me, I think Rafa would be cool, obviously, long term. Or maybe him and Federer could do it. Oh, player coach. Oh, that Rafa would be sweet, as a player wouldn't coach. it? Oh, no, I mean, once he's retired as well, okay. like they could do a, a duo coaching. You maybe know, just a Legends Labour Cup. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then for World, ooh. Yeah, I feel maybe like an Agassi or, or, mm. or someone like that coming out and doing a bit more. We don't really see too much of him. 
Um, what would be cool is if we had some fe- maybe female coaches it, well, like get them, or, uh, yeah, get a Maresmo or, or or someone. Quite. I mean, she's probably mm. too busy with French Open. But, I haven't uh, forgiven her for the French Open. Uh, <laughs> I know. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I feel like she's probably got bigger issues to, uh, going on at the moment. Of all the but, people uh, to go for, Joel, I'm triggered. Yeah, <laughs> it would be good to have a combined Labour Cup, though, wouldn't it? Like mm. women and men together. But that's well, probably that that's a three hour discussion. So, um, but talking of combined cups, we do have the possibility of a, of a united cup <laughs> um, which is to replace the ATP cup so this is going to be the build-up event for the Australian Open men and women together another mixed gender tennis event uh, called the united cup um, I guess you know we used to have this basically we used to have the Hopman cup it was removed and now it's basically coming back um, but this is going to have ranking points um, as part of it um, so I mean what's your opinion yay or nay are you are you pleased about this news? Finally, finally, some something right. Finally, something right. I mean, this. I mean, this is for me. This is this is great news. Um, it's great to see the ATP and WTA, you know, collaborating, working together to put something into the tour that um, you know, it feels like you know for many fans, including myself, should have happened, you know, a few years ago. I think, you know, as I think there'll be people with views on 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 the ATP Cup. Has it been a success? Has it been a failure? I think, you know, for me, it sh- should never have existed in the first place. I think, you know, we've seen, I think, mixed events come on on leaps and bounds, particularly just in 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 sport in in general. I, you know, I think about the Olympics, and I loved watching kind of you know like mixed relays, you know, on on the track and. I think it's a really smart move that we are getting back a, a mixed event, but yeah, I just don't think it should have it shouldn't have left it in, in the first place. And uh, the fact that it's going to be legitimised even further with ranking points as well, I think it it just it's just going to be. I think it should, uh, you know, in theory, be a great event. Absolutely, I think um, as long as it gets some like re- I think we could we've got the potential for some amazing partnerships. Like we could have you know Iga Swiatek and Hubert Hercage. We could have Rafa with I don't know, but also whatever. Who decides to play? Radicanu, Jack Pat Draper, Pattery. if he gets the call. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that would be great. I'd love that. I would love so that. Great, great possibilities for teams. So I'm, um, yeah, I think this is a good, good news story. Um, this a bit more kind of close to proximity. Not you know, not January, but but this coming week, we've got seven tournaments on the tour. I'll just list them. We've got Chengdu, uh, Seoul, Sofia, Tel Aviv, Zhuhai. Parma and Tallinn uh so much to get our teeth into um one question before we round up for today what is the one thing you're most looking forward to uh from this coming week on tour Joel do you want to 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 give us your thoughts <laughs> oh big big pressure um by the way seven 250s I mean I know like I know like we had a pandemic and I know that like the <laughs> What the ATP and WTA that need? I'm assuming need lots of money, but that's a that is a lot of a lot of tournaments. But you know, fair play, keep the you know keep the, all the players happy. But um, yeah, for me, uh, I'm I'm in Seoul because Yong Chung, who famously defeated Novak Djokovic, put a photo of his really nasty blister up on on Instagram. Um, you know, Australian Open semi finalist on that incredible run which feels all those years ago back in, in 2018, he has got a wild card uh, into the doubles at the Korea Open. Um, he's playing with Son Woo Kwon. And yeah, he has not played since September 2020. We wow. know his his injury struggles have been, you know, not, not great. But he was such a, I feel like he was such a, a talent and such a, you know, breath of fresh air coming up. He was the first ever next-gen player champion as well and mm. um you know I was, I was just rereading his achievements i mean he's he's 26 now like he's not a he's not a young guy anymore but he's so i felt like he's just so talented and i just always remember him for that victory over novak Djokovic. so it's just i think it's just gonna be great to see him back on a back on a tennis court finding his feet a little bit um yeah it's just a shame that you know his body his body has sort of let him down, I think. Um, and um, yeah, I'm fascinated to see how he how he gets on in Seoul. That is a very yeah. good answer, Joel. That is. Chris, I'm, what about you? I mean, unsurprisingly, I'm in I'm in uh, Palmer for the Barilla Open, um, as I call it, um, where Stone Stevens <laughs> is um, where she's playing. She's actually already won a round, so at least Woo! I can 
breathe a sigh of relief. She actually came through 3-6-6-3-6-4 against Magdalena Fretch in the first round. Um, it was it was touch and go. So um, this week, I think I'll be with with the seven um, seven tournaments in play. I think we'll all be kept very busy <laughs> on the live scoring apps yeah. this week. We'll, yeah. we'll divvy them up. You you can take Palmer and Talin. I'll take Zhuhai and Tel Aviv and Kim. You can take Sophia, Seoul and Chengdu. You didn't Blimey, do very well out of that, Kim. <laughs> there's too much going on. I'm intrigued to see what one of the Lindas um, does. Linda mm. Noskova. Uh, oh, who is you are obsessed with the two Lindas. Lindas. <laughs> you do love the Lindas. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, they're up and coming. And uh, didn't Linda Fruvertiva win, not the week just gone, but the week before, mm. which we haven't covered because... I think, she, was it in Chennai that she got the win? Yeah, so she's won a title. We need Noskova to follow suit. So she's... Uh, one against Deanne Parry today. So come on, Linda. Oh, that's a good win. We've got to give a shout out to Annette Kontovic back in uh, Tallinn, right? She's mm. the top seed there, I believe. Home um, tournament. Home tournament. So hopefully she can reverse her not great form so far. Yeah. And we'll see what Novak Djokovic decides to do, whether he'll oh, yeah, in Tel, Aviv. Tel Aviv or not. Who, who um, is he playing doubles with? I think we were speaking about this before uh, the podcast. Because yes. it sounded like to me you were describing Doody Seller, but it wasn't. No, it's Jonathan Ehrlich, who is a uh, old school uh, Israeli doubles player. Uh, used to play with Ram, I think, back back in the day, f- for a bit, from from my memory. Um, that is Kim. Yeah. You get you get many points for that. Many more than can that be par for the court next week? Yeah. Um, Israeli doubles. Israeli players. doubles players. Okay, <laughs> well, I'll, I'll make sure. I'll make sure that happens. But excitingly, Great. our next episode, our next catch up next week will be our 300th episode um so i hope wow. everyone is looking forward to that once again thanks for listening to tennis weekly with myself kim and chris uh remember to subscribe to us on whatever device you listen to us on we are on apple Podcasts, spotify and all major podcasting platforms out there we are going to be covering the rest of the season yes all the grand slams are over but we'll be carrying it all the way through to the end of season finals so stick with us you can also listen to us on the downloadtennis.com app and if you like what you're hearing then make sure to leave us a rating and comment on apple podcasts or spotify and you can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at Tennis Weekly Pod. Uh, so do give us a like and a follow if you don't already. And let us know any feedback, comments or queries you may have for the Tennis Weekly mailbag. Uh, you can also email us on tennisweeklypod at gmail.com. And don't forget to check out our website, www.tennisweekly.co.uk. And we will be back next Monday at Tennis Weekly HQ to catch up on all seven uh, events on the ATP and WTA tours this week. I hope you can join us for that. But in the meantime, it's goodbye from Kim. Goodbye. It's goodbye from Chris. Goodbye. (laughs) And it's goodbye from me. We'll see you again soon. 